Hello, and welcome to the After Hours Podcast, presented by My Investing Club. I'm your host, Harry Haas, and joining me, as always, is my co-host, James Freelander. Today, we have a very special guest, Stephen, joining us to discuss some hot topics in the world of finance and politics. We'll be diving into the fascinating world of CBDCs, or central bank currencies, and how they are disrupting the financial system. We'll also touch on digital ID and the Federal Reserve, and the recent controversy surrounding the Donald Trump indictment. So sit back, grab a drink, and join us to explore these pressing issues in the world of finance and beyond. What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of the After Hours Podcast. Uh, today we have Stephen, who is a returning guest from a long time ago. Uh, so Stephen, welcome on. Thank you for coming back. Thanks. Of course, of course, man. Um, so we have a full docket today, so we definitely want to get through a lot. So uh, starting off, uh, we want to talk about the rise of CBDCs, which are central bank digital currencies. Uh, and we kind of want to talk about the implications and what that might mean for you as an investor, as an individual, uh, and as a member of society. So Harry, I know you are uh, living in Canada, where that is kind of slowly becoming a, a real thing. And I mean, it is here too, but do you want to lead off and kind of let us know what you're, what you're feeling on it and how you feel it might impact society? Yeah, so basically this has not hit Canada yet. But they're definitely taking steps towards it. Uh, yesterday, TD Bank in Canada came out and basically said, hey, uh, we are going to start limiting your transactions uh, and we're going to start playing with your limits and we don't have to tell you. So that's pretty scary when you're when you're banking and you're at the grocery store and all of a sudden your card doesn't work and you're saying, hey, why doesn't my card work? Well, it's because they changed the limits and they didn't tell you. And so a lot of people in Canada, from what I've been seeing, have been starting to close their TD accounts because they are afraid. And TD basically said, like, you don't have to sign anything to accept this. Uh, if you're still using TD Bank by April 26, you automatically agree to those terms. So I've seen a lot of people close their accounts. Uh, as far as the central bank digital currency, uh, it is kind of scary um, because I've heard different things from uh, different sides. Some people are saying, you know, this is going to be okay. You're going to know where your money is being spent. You're going to know where your money is being, uh, you know, distributed and how you're getting it. And there's not going to be as much illegal activity associated with that. So that's good. Um, from what I've kind of heard and what I've kind of read, there could be a whole spectrum of how far this goes. So number one, uh, the government would be able to track and see where all the money is going, where all the money is being distributed. Uh, so that, to me, definitely limits people's freedoms because, you know, obviously, if you're being watched, whatever you're doing, wherever you're spending your money, you are right now. But if I wanted to take out $500 cash and go and uh, buy drugs off Stephen, you know, obviously, that's a lot harder to track. Um, I'm not saying Stephen's drug dealer, but, you know, um, <laughs> basically, uh, that's hard to to track. But with the CBDC, there would be no such thing as cash. And also, uh, you know, obviously they're going to be a lot more, it's going to be a lot easier to see where things are going. Another thing that I have heard, and this is very interesting as far as the CBDCs, is that there may be a type of, uh, I guess, type of, uh, you know, I don't know how you could call it. You'd have like a wallet, okay? And everyone based on their kind of social credit score would get a different limit. And maybe uh, your limit is only 20,000 coins. So for any new money to come in, you need to spend those 20,000 coins out of your wallet. So that would be a type of scenario where everyone would be forced to spend money, keep the economy going, keep that generator kind of running, but you could only have so much money in your wallet, which would be absolutely crazy to me because how are people supposed to save? And, you know, obviously people are just going to be spending, 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 and if you have like an inheritance coming in of like, let's say, you know, $70,000 and your limit is also 20, that to me is a little bit concerning because, you know, how are you supposed to save any money? You know, we're kind of taught, yeah. you know, at a young age, like, you know, you get a job, you work hard, you save your money. And then at the end of that, you're going to have a nice uh, retirement to fall back on. And that's kind of how you live your life. That's kind of what everyone's told from the beginning. But now, if I can only save 20,000 coins, I'm like, shit, what is the point, you know? So it's definitely interesting yeah. uh, hearing different theories, 
hearing what's going on. Some people are going to say, Harry, you're a conspiracy theorist. Other people are going to go, oh, I know, bro. So it's definitely interesting, but CBDC definitely coming. Uh, if they keep planning to, to print the dollar into oblivion, which is what they're kind of doing right now. Yeah, no, Stephen, uh, you're someone who's worldly, like very well traveled, and you know you go all over the place. So you're you're used to different uh, currencies and all that stuff. So coming from your perspective, what do you think are the implications or positive notes on introducing some sort of central bank digital currency uh, between you know uh, partner nations? Sure. So I mean, obviously the the basics are like you know conversion fees suck. Like anytime I take out cash anywhere. I need to pay. It could be 5%. It could be 10%, right? So if I go to a currency conversion, they're going to get me. Um, if I go to an ATM machine, they're going to get me. The only way they don't get me is if I'm able to charge it on my card. So that's kind of the same concept, right? So I, I have a travel a couple of travel cards because, uh, you know, I they give you zero con, uh, conversion, foreign conversion fees, and they pay me like 2%. So, but they're still making money. I mean, they're making money from the, the guy who's got the machine that I'm swiping the transaction from. So they're still making right. money on the transaction, but they're giving me back 2% and they're not charging me for that foreign conversion. Yeah. A lot of people don't have these cards. Uh, to use cash, you're gonna pay. So that's the downside. To use cash, you're gonna pay. You can't get the money from US dollar to Euro from an ATM or a conversion place without paying some kind of pre a premium. So. I'd say like in that sense, it's probably good if they all got on the same page, but yeah. kind of like Harry mentioned, I mean, I, I don't know, like personally, it kind of depends on the government. I mean, you're, you're now trusting each government to, to treat your information, you know, with a certain level of respect or privacy. And if, I mean, I'm in Turkey a lot, they've got elections in two months. I mean, do I really want like the Turkish government who the current system is probably going to be, uh, might be ousted right uh to to know where i've been spending money and what countries i've been in and all this kind of stuff it's kind of like corruption can lead to in, in my view to more corruption where i see yeah. some governments might be controlling you a little more than others or they might judge you on what you've been spending to go into their country in the first yeah. place Absolutely. and they'll kind of track that so i guess like good and bad but for me i've got probably more fears than than anything yeah i think um i think a lot of people should educate themselves too on the uh, rise and falls of empires i think because the idea of this uh central bank digital currency i in my opinion i think it has two things that it's going after one i think it's going after taxes um i think it wants the government it wants to collect as much in taxes as they can now i'm someone who you know i've worked as a barber i've worked as a uh, at a restaurant as a i've delivered food when i was younger right everybody knows that those, those people they try to take cash right i'm someone i'm very like honest like i very i always claim all my cash tips and everything like that but in the industries i work in a lot of people don't and a lot of people they feel the need to you know pocket cash and spend it so i think the government unfortunately has put itself in a position where it spends more than it earns in the way that a government starts to fix hopefully the decline of a of an empire is by collecting more money and by taxing uh, every single person every single dollar so i think that's kind of their purpose i think num purpose number two is to eliminate uh something like bitcoin from becoming a uh an infection in the economy i think that way they're able to track um and get rid of cr uh, cryptocurrencies because i think right now people think as of bitcoin as a way to spend outside of the us dollar and stay untra uh, untraceable whereas with a cbdc that's just not going to happen and if they don't allow bitcoin to be spent in this country then they won't need it um you know i think the tracking stuff is very interesting um which is kind of bringing us to our next topic of these you know digital ids and like the federally mandated and all that and you know i think from there i want to ask harry because this is something that's really happening in canada right now um yep. that's something i see as a tracking mechanism right less than the cbdc but how do you see the federal id do you think that it's going to be <laughs> canada as it's kind of being introduced right now yeah well so far right now what i have noticed and this is just me i've lived in canada now for 23 years um there's a lot more, uh, I would say like, there's definitely, so the grocery stores here are starting to build infrastructure uh, around. So when you enter the grocery stores here, you have to go through like a little gate now. And that may be standard in the States, but for the longest time in Canada, 
we've been able to just walk into the store, you know, obviously you go through those like little two devices that like detect for shoplifters or whatever. But now in a lot of stores, we have this gate. And what a lot of people are saying here in Canada is that we're going to need to get a digital ID on our phone and we scan it when we go in the store to allow us to get in the store. And now it's going to be used as that kind of tracking mechanism. So just like a vaccine mandate, they're going to try and implement these digital IDs. Um, so far, they've only made it to Ontario, which is like probably the most populated population in Canada right now. But my fear is just, it's just more tracking. They know exactly where you've been. They know exactly your habits. They know exactly your analytics. And to me, it's kind of scary because it's like tracking for no reason, right? Like, why do you need to see what I'm doing all the time? Why do you need to track me further, right? They're like, oh, oh, you know, Harry Haas, he was at the grocery store at 5.02 p.m., little suspicious, right? But you guys would be like, oh, fuck, it's just after the close of trading. Of course, Harry's going to go, you know, grab some food or grab some snacks or a beer or whatever, right? Beer. But yeah, well, not so much anymore, sadly. But um, yeah. I mean, uh, it's definitely interesting. Uh, I don't like it. I'm not a fan of it, obviously. Uh, but yeah, again, we have these kind of digital IDs coming in and it is kind of scary. But for someone like, like for example, for Steven, like we said, he's very well-traveled. Like, do you not see it as a potential safety mechanism that someone is able to travel uh, nation to nation or country to country with a more... Uh, digital and easy to access form of ID that lets people know exactly kind of who you are, where you've been, um, especially in a time of domestic terrorism and, and national terrorism and everything like with, that. With the stuff coming in, uh, it's more so what I found is not necessarily about whether someone like Stephen is a terrorist threat. It's more so about these new kind of laws that they want to implement with the whole 15 minute cities thing and the whole carbon tax here. Whereas, like, I think what they will do is they will put uh, restrictions and they, they're they already doing it. Like, so on April 1st here, uh, gas is going to go up 14 cents a liter and alcohol tax was supposed to go up another 6% here. But now it's only going up another three because people bitched and moaned so hard. So, you know, alcohol is going up. Uh, the carbon tax is going up. But what they do want to eventually propose, what I've seen from the World Economic Forum, is that they're going to give you a carbon quota. So uh, everything you do is going to come out of that quota. So taking a plane, you're going to use points out of that quota. Driving around, they're going. you're going to use points over that quota or on that quota. If you go over that quota, you are <laughs> going to be taxed and fined and they're going to track it by using this digital ID and this digital wallet because they're gonna know exactly how much you've spent, where you've gone, hmm, how have you done this, how have you done that? They have you with the currency as well, what did you spend your money on, right? So, you know, and of course, if you're driving an electric car, they're gonna know exactly where you've been, right? So now it's gone to an extreme point of tracking. So I do think it is good, but for someone like Steven, Steven has a passport. We know generally where the hell he's been, right? Because he has to swipe his passport when he's coming into every country. And if they feel that Stephen is a domestic terrorist threat, they're going to stop him at the gate and search him and do whatever and do that investigation there, right? So, I mean, when you're letting someone in the country, you're already saying, okay, we feel they're safe enough to kind of come in the country, right? We know where he's been because we have his passport and we know that he's not a threat. So let's let Stephen in, right? Whereas I feel with this, it's more of like tracking everyday citizens and tracking everyday, uh, not that Stephen isn't an everyday citizen, but it's more like, you know, tracking the, the everyday man who's not going to Turkey and then flying to like, you know, the UK or like wherever the hell, you know, Stephen's going, right? You know? It's just, I feel like it's just overdoing the tracking on the everyday man. But also, James, on your point, I do feel like, uh, you know, in in my view and in my opinion, I think that what you said on the, uh, shit, I absolutely lost my place. But, you know, what you said on, <laughs> on the, you know, rise and falls of empires is what it was. And what you said on the, uh, that the government is going to try and tax the life 
out of every single person to prevent that fall of the empire is completely right. And I completely agree with that. Uh, that's where I yeah. was going. I lost my point. For yeah. I mean, Stephen, you must see some sort of positive benefit, something like this, because for you, you, we just had this conversation before the podcast started about how you you had trouble getting into a country because you had your passport was uh, full and like they couldn't get in or or something like that or maybe it was expired. Now, with something like a digital current, a digital ID, I mean, they that stuff won't happen, right? Like, you know, how do you feel that will impact your travel? Because that's something you like to do. I feel like. It'll definitely be, it could definitely be easier in, in those small ways, like convenience. And, you know, they they could see like, hey, he's got a visa. So maybe I don't need to like print out the visa and I don't need to, you know, do all these other things. I could just do it online and it's it's applied to my whatever, my digital ID. And then they would know, right? That's like beneficial. Um, I guess like I would just worry a little, like to give an example, in May I'm going to Israel and they've got a lot of protests right now. There's a lot of stuff going on. And I guess they could see my passport and they know that I've been in you know, a lot of Muslim countries or countries that they might not like. But what I really want them to like dig into that, like you spent this much money in this country, you know, like so I'd worry about that. But the ease would be would be better, like the, the, the day to day stuff. And I'll tell you guys something. Maybe it's normal to most people listening. I don't know. But I was pretty shocked by it when I came back to the U.S. Uh, on a trip about six months ago, went to SFO. First time this ever happened to me. I've been, you know, in many, many countries and many passport controls. But I walked up and the the passport control guy, the customs officer, said, uh, Stephen Hansen. And I didn't even hand him my passport. I kid you not. So I'm like, wow. And I had my passport in my hand ready. And he said, oh, st- stop there. And then he said, Stephen Hansen, welcome back. And I said, like, wow, that's pretty good, you know. And he's like, yeah, yeah. And, I, and then after he, you know, just welcomed me, I said, so the, the camera facial recognition, I guess, he goes, he goes, yeah. And he never even touched my passport. So like, Holy shit, that's insane. I guess this kind of facial recognition, it's pretty cool. I mean, I, I, I would say at the time I wasn't really scared. I was more like, that's pretty cool. And then it happened to me too, when I was flying domestically in the US, where normally you have to show your ID again to board the plane, but they had a scanner and I actually posted an after hours and it just beep it's green beep beep and then if it doesn't recognize you it's red and then they check but it's checking your face oh steven should be on this plane you know so like i see the the places i've traveled to which is mainly europe and the middle east lately um i've only seen that in america and i've seen that their technology is really even london i go to london a lot i didn't see any of this there yet so i would say like even if we don't know about it it's already being rolled out you know what i mean and yeah, in absolutely. some ways it's it's kind of cool in some ways, you know? I mean absolutely. I see I see a couple of positive use cases for uh, a digital ID. One, I see that um as far as you know, just e- like general usage and like accessibility, like having an ID on your phone or something like that, something that's just super easy to <laughs> access, I do see as easy, right? I also see as you know, we don't have to deal with expiring licenses, we don't have to deal with, you know giving our ID to a bouncer and all that stuff. It's just very, everything's super easy, right? I think those are positive use cases. The negative use cases that I see for this is the smart cities that come uh, countries like China are creating yes. that eventually will probably come to the U.S. And if, for those who don't know, in uh, I think it's a company called Huawei. They actually are, are uh, they're banned in the U.S. They, they have a bunch of issues. Um, they create smart cities. And there's a lot of companies that are doing that now in, in uh, communist countries or places like China, where the second that you step into these cities, you are identified. It can not only tell you, it tell it to you by your identity, your facial recognition, it can do it by your walk, uh, your voice, if you're near something like that. It has so much power. I have a friend who works uh, for the American government, and he was explaining just how crazy these things really are and how they really know everywhere you go. Um, it will disallow for things like espionage in other countries and stuff like that. But we are all being entered into a massive database, which I think is a little bit scary at times. Um, so I think that unfortunately it's just the way that things are going to go. I think that that's re- the reality is that we're headed in a direction where we have these, these IDs and identities and we've already put them online and everything like that, social media and all this stuff. And eventually it's just going to be in this giant database of like who we are and exactly where we're going to go all the time. So it's scary, but it's cool. And I like hearing that you guys both, because you guys are all in different countries. Harry's in Canada, Stephen travels, he's very worldly traveled. And 
it's just going to be something that either we're going to find a tremendous benefit over or it's going to really kind of scare people yeah. into feeling like they're always being tracked and watched, right? Like, I mean, yeah. we had a huge issue with vaccinations in this country. Um, it was a big fight. 50% of the country didn't want to get vaxxed, 50% did. If your digital ID is now showing that you're getting vaccinated or not, I don't know how I feel about that. You know, I don't know how you guys feel about that, but it's it's scary. And that that's that is an invasion of our privacy, in my opinion. So that you know, there is so many use cases, but again, I see the negative sides of it. Yeah, yeah and I guess tough. it all boils down to how much uh control do you want your government to have over you? And even if you don't know it, they might have control. I mean, there was the whole thing, I don't remember 10 years ago or so, where they found out that the government was listening in on conversations, you know. So like yeah even if they don't admit it, like they're still tracking us. I mean, they yeah. know when you're like on some kind of list. I mean, yep. so like, I don't know, I guess. And like you mentioned China, like that stuff's kind of scary too, because they're actually tracking in public people's faces and attracting them to their social media, what they might've said. And then they're kind of watching them more and, or, you know, worse. So, I mean, I don't know, I guess if, if you really trust government, it, it could be good. The overall ease of an, to a normal guy like me who's not, you know, on any, hopefully on anybody's bad guy list, you know, probably my life will get easier. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I don't know. There could be mistakes made or your government could just go a little too far. I mean, in Turkey, they had an attempted coup a couple years back and <laughs> a lot of people in the government left and they caught a lot of the airport. And I mean, you could imagine, and they've got elections coming up in a few months. You can imagine a government like that, not to pick on them. But it could happen anywhere. A government like that could say, wait, who was voting during this time at these polling stations? Yeah. Who was, you know, involved with this, affiliated with this group and this group? And even stuff like football clubs around around Europe and the world, they're affiliated with political groups. So yeah. Like, you know, would you really want, like, your government to know all this kind of private stuff, you know? So exactly. yeah. pros and cons, but I don't think exactly. we could stop it. You know? I, don't either. <laughs> I, I think that's really interesting. And I like that. I think that you brought up another interesting topic for us to transition to is these other countries and other world powers and all that and the changing world order. And, you know, as, as of right now, we sit, it is Thursday, March 30th. Um, a lot of countries around the world are transitioning away from using the U S dollar in trade. They're moving over to the yuan, which is the Chinese currency. Um, you know, we, since Bretton Woods, uh, in the 40s, have been the world reserve currency, uh, which has made us the world power. We are the most right now important nation in the planet, but that is changing in front of our eyes. And Harry, I don't know what you think about all this, because it is scary, I think, in my opinion, but how do you feel about all of this kind of happening now? Well, I just think it's another example of Biden asleep at the wheel. You know, we have so many things going on right now, and they're choosing to focus on you know, trans rights and stuff like that, which I'm not saying are not important. They are important. But in my opinion, we need to be focusing on uh, economics. We need to be focusing on maintaining that world power, because if it, things are not maintained and well kept, then, you know, things tend to fall apart. Right. And right now, we need to be focusing on maintaining foreign policy and uh, maintaining good relationships. And behind it, not even behind everyone's back, right in front of our faces. We've seen China partner with Russia. We have seen China partner with the Saudis. We have seen China partner with Brazil to do these kind of foreign oil transactions that they do and to do transactions that these companies are making between each other uh, with the Chinese yuan. And if the Chinese yuan does somehow become the world currency, that has catastrophic effects for the dollar, including inflation, how much debt the U.S. is even able to borrow in the first place. Uh, the question of how valuable is the dollar? You know, we took the, the, the dollar off the, the gold standard, Richard Nixon did in 1971. And now it's like, OK, what is the dollar's value even based off of now? Right. So it impacts a lot more than people realize and right now everyone's focused on these other distractions everyone's fucking minding their own business head down doesn't really know like they don't really know what's going on i'd say a vast majority of people and i think that people really need to pay attention and 
I think that people really need to vote accordingly. I think the next two elections in Canada and the USA are going to be two very important ones, even more important than the last one we had. And I think people really need to vote uh, with, I think how James kind of put it the other day, I was thinking to myself the other day, like when we were on a podcast, you know, you vote really country first. And I think that's how people need to be voting now is really country first. You know, I think that you made a great point in the other podcast. And even I was thinking about it, thinking, yeah, you know, vote country first and vote for the next hundred years. Because I think, you know, we're we're going definitely, if we're not in it already, into some economic pain, you know. But with pain, you know, can come resilience and can set us up for the next hundred years, you know. So I really do think that if we are focused on the next 100 years, the next 200 years on building and growing and getting better and strengthening the US and Canada, then we can really make a difference. But if we're focusing on things that I'm not saying don't matter, but in the next 200 years, you know, there are more important issues here than just people's feelings and how people are feeling, you know, it sometimes you have to put feeling second, you know, and sometimes you have to put in the work. It's just what we did with trading, you know, How many times could we have sat back and complained and bitched and whined? But what do we all do? We all put in the work, you know, and right now I'm seeing a lot of complaining and bitching and whining and not a lot of fixing things and how they are going about fixing things is, in my opinion, not the right way, you know, so I I, I just think the next, you know, 100 years, you know, these these elections are are what really matter because you know you see Putin and uh, you see President Xi. President Xi said to Putin, you know, the next hundred years are going to be a big wake up call for the for the United States and for Canada and for for Mexico for the West, right? So that is kind of scary that the way the Chinese are thinking is that they are coming after us. They're coming after our res- reserve currency status. And, you know, if you think inflation is bad now, you just wait till we lose that status, if we do. Yeah. Stephen, how do you feel? Yeah, so mainly to that point, I mean, if if oil and debts and, and everything else aren't settled with the U.S. dollar, then we end up having too many dollars. And that means that it loses value, right? So that's the scary thing. I'd say... To your point, Harry, China has a 50, and I, not to brag, but I speak Chinese. I lived in Taiwan a while and I studied Chinese there. So (laughs) humble brag, no, just kidding. So China has a 50 to 100 year plan, right? We do not, you know, we seem to be focused on what's happening now. What's happening, I mean, what's the next election? I mean, we don't even know what these candidates are gonna be pushing for, but it's just, you know, these kind of fringe issues, right? Yep. China has the whole country on the same page, which I'm not saying is good because it's a one party system. But in our system, uh, we don't have mandatory voting. So what ends up happening is the fringes, the far left, the far right, end up being the ones that vote and they end up yep. being the ones that matter. So you get political parties that appeal to either side. So you don't get just this normal guy who's focused on economics. You get somebody way out here or way out here, my opinion, yep. right? So that's kind of the downside. And, and you know, I travel like, you know, we keep saying I, I'm in another country all the time. And what I see the past four years almost is everybody who talks to me and says, oh, you're American. You know, that's good. And then they kind of smile and then they want to, like, say what's on their mind. Right. I'm like, what's yeah. up? And <laughs> like, why do you guys like why are you guys focused on this? Or why is this your issue? Kind of like Harry said, or why are there so many school shootings? Why this and this? And it's kind of like you know, currency and the power of any currency is based on our faith in that currency. So like people have faith that the U.S. government will be here tomorrow and that the dollar is strong and it will be strong tomorrow. So they invest in it, right? And they use it to settle debts, uh, transactions. So when we throw that all into turmoil and everybody says, well, there's a school shooting every week and these guys aren't even thinking about the economy. They're thinking about his feelings are hurt or his are hurt or, you know, what's going on. And it's all these kind of fringe issues that are now in the front. These issues are important. I'm not saying they're not, but they shouldn't be the number one determining factor for whether you vote for Democrat or Republican. It should be like, Hey, here's the plan. Here's an economic plan. This is what I want to do. 
if you like my plan, vote for me. But instead, it's like, hey, you know, <laughs> I don't even want to repeat the crazy things that these guys say. Yeah. So to me, this is making America, making the world lose confidence. Steven's like, how do I, how do I not get canceled? <laughs> I don't want to get canceled, right? I mean, I've been, I haven't been canceled yet. But I'm telling you, like, I've had a lot of beers with a lot of people in a lot of countries, and it's always falls back to this conversation. Why are you guys worried about this and this and that? And, you know, it, it makes the world, I think, and I see, lose confidence in us and in our currency. And that's bad for the dollar. I agree. So, and I feel like, I feel like, unfortunately, like, us as a country, we, as Americans, we're very arrogant in a way, thinking that things can never end, that the train can never stop. Uh, I think that people the American way is is the only way and that that will never change. And I think that people need to wake up and realize like we do need to band together and we do need to be stronger together because I think countries notice when nations are divided politically. Again, if you guys all uh, like learning, you know, watch Ray Dalio's Changing World Order. And he talks about it very clearly when countries become divided politically and they have social issues uh, and they have economic issues like recessions, depressions, etc. You know, we become weak. And it's not necessarily just who's in charge at the time, although I do feel like right now we're focused on the wrong things. But I do think that people in other countries take advantage. Just as you know, China has a 100-year plan. They always talked about yep. it. But right now, they're taking action now. And that's not coincidence. So I think they're taking advantage of who's in charge and what we're focused on. At this time, we're focused on wars in Ukraine. We're focused on social issues when we really should, in my opinion, be focused on keeping America a strong, amazing, resilient country that we have all come to know and love. But, you know, American patriotism right now feels dead and we kind of need to revitalize that. So it's scary. It's scary for sure. And I think, you know, as the what you can do as an individual, as an investor, as a person, a trader, whatever, is really educate yourself on the issues at hand and what's going on. You know, don't just kind of fall into this mainstream media and see see what you see on the news and whatever whatever you follow. You know, do your own digging and realize like, you know, things can change and what we're going through right now is not necessarily going to be better for us in the long term focusing on social issues. You know, when it comes to voting time, you need to vote on who's going to fix the country and keep it the country that you grew up in and the amazingness that we have now, so. Yeah, I, and to your, sorry, to your point, Harry, uh, James, you know, our enemies, I would say countries hostile to America know exactly what you were describing. They know that we can't be beat all out in, in a war. I mean, it's never gonna happen, yep. but we can succumb to civil war and civil unrest and destroy ourselves. Yep. And that's how the Romans and a lot of empires fell. Yeah, And they know right. that, and they use that against us uh, in social media and everything else. Yeah, that's, you know. There was a lot of interference in, in previous campaigns from hostile nations who were, were using wedge issues to drive voting. And it was like they would they would call on one party to go protest here, then call the other guys who don't like that issue to also go protest in the same area. And they would just try to get this kind of civil unrest out to the world. And again, it's about confidence and it's about our stability. Yep. And it's dangerous. So okay. I agree a thousand percent. We need to find a way to come together a little better than we do. I mean, we're really not all that different, no matter what your political views are. I agree a hundred percent. I think that we are coming up on the time that we have to wrap it up, but I think that we're all kind of on the same page that it's time that we all kind of work together, figure out some, some more serious issues and, yeah. you know, use these podcasts to get educated, you know, use uh, these things, look up Ray, please, for the love of God, look up Ray Dalio's changing world order video. You guys will love it. And it'll really educate you on what's going on in the world. Um, and what's kind of happening in the U.S. And I think sometimes we get so hyper-focused on our, our personal issues and our social issues not to really see what's happening in the world. So um, I do want to thank you guys. Yeah, you guys have been awesome listeners all the time. Agreed. And if, if we have a set, could we just touch on one fast thing? Yeah. Uh, what do you guys think? <laughs> Trump, Go Trump got indicted. I mean, this is crazy, right? That is crazy. I yeah, think we got that's... three minutes left. Okay. Right, a minute each. Ready? I think that... The Trump indictment is extremely, extremely dangerous for society. I think that that is a show of political uh, power in trying to take out another former president and a nominee in the next election as he's already announced he's running. I think it's really scary. And I think that I'm not saying who I vote for, none of that. But I do think at the end of the day that it's political pressure for one person to basically take him out of the race because I think they know that if Trump runs, he's probably going to win.
Awesome. Reading. So that means I got a minute and 28, I guess. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. Uh, I do think, I do think that, uh, that, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's bad. And, but I also think it's pretty good for Trump. You know, if you're a Trump supporter right now, this is rallying up the base. This is pissing people off, you know, that they're going ahead and dealing with these type of issues. And I think a lot of people on the Republican side really see that, you know, we have a lot bigger issues going on right here than did Trump pay Stormy Daniels 150000 to shut up, you know? They're, I mean, that's what this is over. It's not that Trump did, you know, extreme wire fraud or Trump colluded with China, which you could say some people on the other side have some pretty good proof that that happened, right? So again, I do think that there are worse things going on and worse things that have happened, like what happened to the Epstein Island, you know, like what happened with that? So, you know, obviously I'm coming up on my one minute mark, but I do think a lot worse things have happened. And I think that this is going to rally up the Trump base and secure Trump dub. Uh, Steven? Yep, I think it's a big distraction. I think the Trump base is going to come out even more than they were before. They're going to support him. Uh, and again, it's just something that we shouldn't even be really talking about. We should be focused on real issues. But now it's all we're going to see in the news for the next six months. So I think yeah. it, do it doesn't help anybody. And I, I guess it helps Trump. You know, I, I don't know. But it doesn't help our country and our reputation in the world. All right, this, is, this, is exactly what, this is exactly what you just said with the civil war, the civil unrest. And I think yes. that's a good spot to end it as we're coming up on our less than a minute warning here. Yeah. here. Uh, <laughs> all right, boys. Is, <laughs> this was a great podcast. Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out. And, uh, yeah, we'll definitely see everyone for the next one. So see you guys. Thanks, guys.